Creating these classes requires equipment and services that cost money. If you appreciate this education, please think about going to elithecomputerguy.com and offering a one-time or monthly recurring donation. Welcome back. As you know, I am Eli the Computer Guy, and in today's video, I'm going to be telling you what the best programming language for you to learn is. That's right. You want to get into the tech field. You want to become a coding professional. In today's video, we're going to talk about what the best programming language is for you to learn. Now, in order to figure out what the best language for you to learn is, I suppose the, the first place we should start is, is with Google. So why don't we just go over to Google and actually do a basic search to see what the best programming language currently is. So here we are at my computer. I have gone to Google and I have plugged in the best programming language. If we come down here, we can see that there are a whole bunch of different blog posts and articles telling us what the best programming languages are for us. So it should be relatively easy to figure out what it is we should learn. So if we go over, we take a look at one of these, right? So this is from the IEEE, the Computer Society. If we scroll down, we can see what their options are. They say number one is Python. Python, number two is Kotlin, uh, if we keep going down, number three is Java, uh, number four is JavaScript and Node.js, number five is TypeScript, uh, number six is Go, and so on and so forth. You go down and you see Swift. But then we go over, we take a look at the nine best programming languages from Full Stack Academy, and let's see what they have to say. If we scroll down, we can see number one position, they have a JavaScript. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, over here, IEEE, IEEE, number one they said was Python. Well, what's, what's going on here? If we scroll down, we take a look, number two is Swift. That was, that was much further down on the list from IEEE. We keep going down Scala. Well, that, that wasn't even over here on I, IEEE. We got C and C++. Python's down at number five. We got PHP, we got Ruby. Oh, this is this is starting to get a little confusing. Okay, well, let's go over here. So this is the, the 10 best programming languages. So if we go here, this is Guru99. He's a guru. Uh, so Python is number one here. Uh, we go down, number two is Java. And we can start to see there, there are some similarities, but then we got R. What the hell's R? These people never talk about R. What the hell's R? And R is in number, number three position. We keep scrolling down. Okay, we got to see JavaScript. We see Swift. Okay, so we're starting to see some of the, the, the old familiar ones, but then we see these random ones pop in like R and all this. And as we can see, as we can see, different people have a different um, code, coding languages in the number one position. Some are Python, you know, somebody else is saying, uh, was it JavaScript over here? Oh, that can be a little confusing. So maybe, maybe this is the wrong question. Maybe that's wrong. Again, when we use something like Google, if you type in the wrong question, then by default, any answer you're going to get is probably the wrong answer for what you're looking for. So what if we go to Google, we type in most jobs for coding languages, right? Maybe that'll, maybe that'll be a little bit easier for us, right? If we're trying to get jobs here. So I clicked on a couple of options and we look at the most jobs, 10 most in-demand programming jobs. We scroll down here, uh, we can see Python. Okay, Java, JavaScript, C, C++, Ruby, Go, Kotlin again, PHP, Objective C, and Swift. Woo! I wasn't sure what R was, but here, but here it shows us the top 10. R is nowhere there. So, okay, maybe I should pick one of these. If we go over and we take a look at Coding Dojo for Coding Bootcamp, you can see Java, Python, JavaScript, C, C, Sharp, PHP. And then we got Perl. Wait a minute. What the hell is Perl? Oh, oh. Oh, you thought you thought this was gonna be an easy video. You thought you thought this was gonna be an easy video from Eli the Computer Guy. Oh no, oh no. If you're expecting to come to Eli the Computer Guy and get a simple answer, <laughs> well, let's just say you're you're probably not going to be satisfied by this video. So by taking a moment just to go over and take a quick look at Google, I think that gives you an example of why it is so difficult to figure out what the best programming language is, is to learn. I get from so many people, again, people email me and contact me and they say, Eli, I don't wanna get into the complicated stuff. Don't, don't teach me too much. Don't ask me too many questions. Don't don't poke me and prod me and try to figure out what problems I'm trying to solve. No, Eli, just tell me the best programming language to learn. Oh, and then I get a migraine and <laughs>
<laughs> for a while, I've been saying very snarky comments, and it all goes downhill from there. So the big thing that I want you to understand is genuinely, when I say there are a ton of programming languages, I'm not saying there's a ton of programming languages, you know, when in the entire scheme of programming languages. So if, if you include COBOL, and if you include Pascal, and if you include BASIC, there's so many programming languages. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in actual use right this second, there's a crap ton of programming languages. And apparently Perl, apparently they're saying Indeed has 13,000 Perl jobs. I was surprised, I, <laughs> color me surprised. I was, I was in fact surprised by that one. I didn't know Perl was still that popular. Um, and so that's that's one of the, the issues you get into. So, so a lot of folks go out there and they say, what is the best programming language? And then they expect an answer. And it's, it's that whole problem of, well, it depends. It really, really, really depends. So the first thing it depends upon when you're, you're thinking about going out there and learning a programming language is again, what is your situation? What problem? are you trying to solve? This is one of the biggest issues I have with newbies, especially folks that you know don't code, don't do anything, is if you have absolutely no problems to solve, it becomes very, very uh, difficult to tell you uh, what you should try to learn uh, because you're not actually playing around with anything. Again, as I say, uh, with my little Arduino projects, right? So we're gonna be, keep picking up the wrong one. Is this it? No, that's not it. Where is it? Uh, oh, that's it, right? Uh, so I've been doing these Arduino projects, right? So uh, we're gonna be doing more of these. We're gonna be doing videos shortly. And so this is a little Arduino Uno. And so this is what's called a microcontroller. So you can attach sensors to it, or you can have it trigger physical actions like turning on fans, turning on pumps, that type of thing. Um, and so what I wanna do is I wanna create a whole little uh, infrastructure using these, basically creating an IoT infrastructure. So since I know what I wanna do, I wanna put temperature sensors, I wanna put humidity sensors, I wanna put moisture sensors, I wanna do that. And I want those to be able pro to programmatically trigger physical actions to happen, water pumps to turn on, fans to turn on that type of thing, um, I have an idea of what problem I want to solve. Uh, and so it's pretty easy to learn languages. Again, uh, the Arduino uh, IDE, using the, what's called an Arduino IDE in order to code for this, and basically it uses a derivative of C. Um, it's kind of one of those things in the programming languages, programming languages, and they grab parts of it. Nah. Anyways, it's C-ish, it's C-ish, but it's it's Arduino. There, there's a language for Arduino. Uh, then uh, when this connects to the network, it needs to send its information up uh, to a server. And in that server, basically what this can do is it can send post information. If you don't know what I'm talking about, whatever. Basically it can send the values of variables using something called post. And then when it sends that to a server, you need a language, you need a, a, a script up there to be able to take that post data, uh, be able to read it, and then be able to do something such as put it into a database or whatever. So with me, uh, I need what is called a server-side scripting language in order to do that. Um, I already know PHP, I, I like PHP, so I'll use PHP for that. Then in order to actually put the information into a database, so PHP can take the post data, but then it has to write it somewhere. And so in order to write it somewhere, I want to write it into a MySQL database table. So in order to write it into a MySQL database table, you need to use a language called uh, SQL, a structured query language in order to do that. So PHP will basically send a SQL statement uh, to, to that database to, to write the data. Then when uh, information needs to be read out, basically in reports or whatever to trigger events to happen, PHP will be able to grab that. Uh, then if I want it to show up on a web browser or something, like that, then I know I need to know HTML, I need to know CSS, and if I want fancy little graphics or animations to happen, I need to know something called JavaScript, right? So, because I have an idea of the problem that I want to solve, it's very paint by numbers. Okay, I need to code for this. Here's a question. What language do I use to code for this? Oh, I use Arduino IDE. Okay, now that I know that, I need to be able to send post data. So, okay, figure out the post. Okay, so I need a language to be able to grab that post data and do something with it. And then I can see what languages are able to do that. And then I can figure out what language I prefer. And then it's like, okay, I grab that data. Now we need to put it somewhere. Am I putting it into a file? Am I putting it into a database? Am I, you know, doing whatever else? Uh, so if I'm putting it on my SQL database, then I need to know SQL, structured query language. If I was gonna be putting it onto like one of these cloud database systems, so uh, Google has a cloud database system or whatever else, I may need a different language, right? So basically, 
way it's all paint by numbers if you have a problem to solve to figure out how you're gonna solve the problem. Again, uh, if you're in the Microsoft world, so let's say you're a system administrator in the Microsoft world uh, and you're trying to be able to administer your systems better, you may decide to use C Sharp. So C Sharp is Microsoft's basically coding language uh, to be used on what's called the Microsoft stack. So if you need to be able to access and deal with Active Directory and the Exchange server and the Microsoft file servers and possibly you know get to Azure and bring in services there. If I need to connect all those things, most likely, depending on what you're doing, uh, C Sharp is the way to go. So this is why it's important for you to have a problem. <laughs> have a problem you're trying to solve. I don't I don't care whether it's making sure your plants get watered and they don't die from dehydration or if it's connecting active directory into some kind of biometric system to trigger notification events to happen, right? Having a problem to solve makes life a lot easier cuz you just okay, what language do I use to do whatever that is? Uh if you don't have a problem and you are basically looking for jobs, one of the big things that I would tell you to do, and I've talked about this before, is go to meetups and talk with tech companies in your particular area. Something that's very important to understand, people want jobs, right? Um, and that's one of the biggest problems. Like one of the biggest problems with things like this, you know, top seven jobs, again, especially noobs, they'll they'll take a look at something like this and go, ah, okay, Java, or ah, okay, Python, or ah, okay, Perl. Again, <laughs> seriously? <laughs> Pearl. But the, the big thing uh, to be thinking about uh, with this is the coding languages that are needed in your particular geographic area. So I was thinking, I think about this with the startup community a number of years ago, right? A lot of web apps were being created. And here in the Baltimore area, for whatever reason, PHP was the go-to language. So over on the West Coast, so West, like anything West of the Mississippi, seemed like everybody was using Ruby on Rails. When I talked with any tech company creating web apps, West of the Mississippi, they were using Ruby on Rails, right? So if you were in Austin, if you were in Denver, if you were in San Francisco, you wanted to create web apps, uh, probably the best way to go was Ruby on Rails. But for whatever reason, <laughs> I don't know. I, I talked with the CEOs. I talked with the hiring people. I don't know why. But here in this particular area, PHP was huge. So that's one of the things you have to be thinking about is within your geographic area, the programming languages that are most significant and possibly pay the most amount of money may be different than in other geographic areas. Again, uh, weird things here, like in the Baltimore area. So we have an area called Hunt Valley. So Hunt Valley is, it's just no, I mean, it's just a, it's a suburb. It's just like completely, truly, totally normal suburb. If you saw Hunt Valley, you want to think twice about Hunt Valley. It's just, Hunt. it literally is just Hunt Valley. Uh, but one of the weird things is, is for some reason, that was a big hub for video game creation. Zynga was there. A lot of video game companies were out of this weird, Again, I have no idea why. It's this weird little suburb of Baltimore that had a lot of video game companies. So again, if you were interested in creating video games, going and talking with some of those video game companies and figuring out what languages they need would be a good way to go and figure out what programming languages you should learn. Again, being here in Baltimore near the DC area, if you're just trying to learn a programming language and get a job, again, I know in DC, they're still running COBOL. That seems like a joke to people. That's more of a joke than Pearl. But, right, they got systems. If they're still running COBOL, even if in 2020 or, or later, the fact of the matter is they have systems. They need somebody to administer those systems that know that programming language. So that may be a weird, good way to get a job. You know, a 21-year-old who's willing to learn COBOL that might actually be surprisingly valuable. So if you're thinking about trying to figure out one of these coding languages, again, it's good. Go take take a look what the best programming languages are. Go take a look at the top you know programming language, so, you know top paid programming language and that type of thing. But once you've done that, then go and look in your local area. Go to meetups, talk with people, see what companies are hiring for because you may be surprised what companies are hiring for. Again, um, I was talking with one CEO of a small development company in our area and a couple of years ago I mean like no lie he was paying forty thousand dollars a year uh, to <laughs> you can't really call them PHP developers for PHP developers that knew nothing uh, if if you were motivated if you were disciplined if you were focused and you were willing to learn PHP 
he would start you at $40,000 a year just because he was so desperate for PHP coders. And so again, you can be sitting there going, well, Py Python's the best or whatever. But if this guy's willing to pay you 40 grand, like knowing nothing, literally all you needed was motivation to get that job, uh, that might be a better way to go for you. So starting out this particular video, I do really do want you to understand that the whole concept of the best programming language really is kind of ridiculous from the get-go. Depends on your situation and depends on what people are hiring for in your particular area. Now, once I've said all that, now once I've said all that, now I'm actually going to tell you what the best programming language is. I know, it's whiplash, it's whiplash. One minute I say I'm gonna tell you the best, then, then I say there's not really best, and then I'm gonna tell you the best again. Oh, it, it, it can make somebody's brain hurt. Uh, yes, yes, that's, that's the case. Remember, if you're going to get in the tech field, get a big old bottle of Tylenol. <laughs> Caffeine, Tylenol. Drugs of choice for geeks everywhere. But the one programming language that you do need to learn, every coder needs to learn it, frankly, every IT professional needs to learn it, and if you're watching this, you're probably a noob or a wannabe, is, drum roll please, <laughs> HTML. Hypertext markup language. Uh, if you're going to be in the tech industry, if you're going to be a coder, the first language you should learn is hypertext markup hypertext markup language. Uh, now, it's not technically a programming language. Oh my God, I get so many snots. Oh, I get so many college freshmen that give me so much crap because I have a video, I have a video, video a long time ago, I did introduction to HTML programming. And oh my golly, if there's anything that makes freshman computer science majors lose their mind, it's here somebody calling HTML a programming language. It is in fact, to be clear, a markup language. What do I mean by a markup language? Basically, this is a formatting language. So if you go to a website and you're looking at the website, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the bones of the website, right? If you if you go to a house that's being built and you see the structure, you see the beams, you see the walls, that type of stuff, that's kind of like HTML. And then everything else gets glued or painted or nailed on top of it. Uh, so when you look at a web page, there's gonna be a head to the web page that you may not see, uh, you may not notice, uh, but things like title, right? So up at the, the top of a web page, uh, up on the bar, it'll say the title, you know, this is a web page or something like that, uh, that's actually within the head uh, portion of the, the HTML coding. Uh, when you go down to the body portion, the, the sizes of, 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 of letters or words or, or how, how things are broken out, that type of thing, that's all done with, with HTML. It's basically a very simple uh, um, formatting language that allows you to do things such as you create forms. So if you create a form asking for somebody's information, the form itself will be in HTML. So if you're doing web apps, uh, and then when you hit the submit button, it will then send the, the information you plugged into that form to a script that will actually do something based off of its programming. Uh, why HTML is important now is basically any web app that you're going to be dealing with has HTML. It's everything that you're seeing when you look at that web page. If you go to elidecuterguy.com, the base of it is HTML. If you go to youtube.com, the base of it's HTML. Anything that's in a web browser, the base of it is going to be HTML. So to understand how lists are created and understand how to how you know tags are done, that is absolutely necessary for a new person. And it's also important, uh, even if you're gonna be developing uh, desktop applications or mobile applications nowadays, uh, because a lot of times you'll see with these uh, desktop or mobile applications that they use web technologies, right? So again, if you go back 10 or 15 years, desktop was desktop, smartphone was smartphone, and web was web. They were they really were basically their own word worlds. They didn't really they didn't really share a lot of the core technologies. Uh, nowadays, though, uh, if you're using a desktop application on a, a Mac or on a Windows machine, uh, many times what is being presented to you really is more or less just just a web page, right? The uh, the application is presenting a web page to you uh, versus you know going to it through a web browser. But a lot of the formatting, a lot of things 
things behind it are, again, still in basic HTML. So HTML is, is absolutely necessary. If you're a wannabe, if you're a noob, if you don't know HTML, learn it. It takes a day, one day. <laughs> One day you can learn it. It's not that complicated. Along with HTML, one of the things that you should also learn is something called CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. Uh, that's what kind of gives um, web pages a little bit more of the pizzazz. So uh, changing fonts, changing colors, creating basic shapes, uh, doing that type of stuff, that will be in CSS. Uh, so CSS is something that you, have a, you should have a basic understanding of. Again, one day. One day for HTML, one day for CSS. And the final language uh, in this whole formatting language thing that you should probably take a look at is something called XML, extendable, extendable markup language. Uh, where this is used nowadays a lot of times is things such as RSS feeds. So if you're dealing with things like podcasts, those use XML files. And basically what it is, is it's a formatting style for things when you're sending, like, when you create an application that has to be able to read stuff into it, uh, a lot of times uh, it'll be able to read XML files. And so XML files uh, you're able to use, basically it's formatting, but now you use it for things such as podcasting and other kind of like communication type services. Uh, but it's, it's very useful to understand and at least know the basics of. So really, again, there is, to be clear, there is no one absolutely best coding language, but, you know, HTML, like, if there was gonna be one, HTML is the one you need to learn. It's it's not gonna pay you a lot of money or anything, and HTML on its own can actually do a lot, but, but if you need to learn something, learn HTML first. Now, once you've learned HTML and CSS, go learn it, seriously. <laughs> You're not gonna make a hundred grand knowing HTML, but you do need to know it. Uh, the next language to talk about is again, PHP. Now a lot of people, I don't know, whenever I talk about PHP, they absolutely lose their minds, but I talk with a lot of professional coders, and again, in our area, uh, PHP is an in-demand uh, skill set, and it is very useful to understand, especially with PHP 7 now. A lot of people argue it's it's as good, you know, it's, it's a good, fine uh, programming language, and so PHP is one that you may want to look at. Now, if you're thinking about it, you're like, well, why, why would I want to learn PHP? So PHP is something called a server-side uh, scripting language. So what that means is basically, Basically, you type out all the PHP code in a text file, it's completely normal text file. You can literally use, you can use Notepad, you can use um, text edit in Mac, you can use G edit in Linux, like just, when I say a text file, I mean a, a text file, right? So you can write PHP as a text file. You simply name it .php instead of .txt uh, when you're finished with it. And then what happens is when you put that onto a server, you install what's called a PHP interpreter. So there is a scripting language interpreter. So with this, it's PHP. And basically what happens is whenever a PHP file is called, that interpreter reads it, and then basically it just runs the commands. It, it runs the program program that's been created. Why PHP is a very valuable language to learn is because it is the most prominent uh, scripting language out on most standard uh, hosting plans that you're going to deal with, right? So if you go out to GoDaddy, HostGator, or whatever else, uh, and they're going to, they, they tell you what uh, they offer with their particular uh, hosting plans or possibly with their servers, PHP is always going to be installed. Sometimes also Python, uh, but with all of these servers is always going to be PHP. You're going to have the basic uh, PHP and MySQL stack on all these servers. And so that is very valuable. So if you're going to be building, uh, you know, basic web apps for customers, for clients, for your company, knowing that essentially any server that you're going to be putting it on, uh, especially any public server they're going to be, be purchasing, uh, you know, renting or whatever, is going to have PHP, that is incredibly valuable. One of the issues, if you go on with a different uh, scripting language such as Python, uh, that's going to be put on servers, is a lot of the shared hosting plans simply do not uh, offer Python as part of their package. Why this is also important is that PHP has been around for a long time, right? 20 years. So people have been using PHP and MySQL for 20 years, and this is where you get into the world of legacy applications. If people have been using it for 20 years, that means there's a hell of a lot of code out there that's been created that has to be maintained, has to be modified, has to be upgraded, and frankly, 
likely a lot of people aren't going to want to have that code completely rewritten into a different language. Could a different language do things better? Yes. Is a company going to spend a million dollars to basically take something from PHP to something else without any actual benefit that they can see? No. Again, that's why COBOL is still around, right? If, if PHP does the job and it's secure and all that, then they're just going to keep stay with PHP. So I would argue for a lot of people, PHP is a great language to learn because it's legacy. There is a lot, there's a lot of apps. There's a lot of software out there that's already been created using PHP. Again, if you're going to be dealing with WordPress, if you download, so if you go um, to any like website that generally has like open source web applications that you can download help desk applications messaging applications different stuff like that uh, a huge portion of the time those are going to be built in php so the nice thing again with open source is you can download uh previously created projects and then you can go in there and if you know the language you can go and you can you can twiddle and you can you can do things uh with that particular product to turn it into something valuable so think about php it's on again Again, if you're going to be dealing with shared hosting plans, GoDaddy, HostGator, that type of thing, you're going to be creating web apps for like small business clients, that type of deal. PHP is a very good way to go. And again, I talk with coders all the time and they're happy with it. Now, when I was talking about PHP, I also brought up another scripting language called Python. So Python is another scripting language. And frankly, if you're an IT professional, so you're a system administrator, I would really say you should probably take a look at Python. One of the problems with PHP is that it's not, it's not as loved as it used to be, right? With PHP, uh, people used to use it for email services and for database services and for a lot of things. And it was great for about 10 years. But the thing is, is you know, the, the world changes, technology moves on, different products and services come out there. And frankly, for a lot of the new products and services, uh, PHP has been left behind. So when we start talking about things like APIs, uh, basically being able to communicate with other companies, other vendors' services that they have on the cloud that they have on the web the fact of the matter is there many times there are not apis for php but there are apis for a language called python so python again you sit there you type it out you can type it out essentially in a normal text editor if you really want to and then there's a scripting engine that is able to then parse uh, what you have typed out and turn that into whatever program uh, that you've created. The nice thing with Python is it's a very, uh, very good general services programming language. So one, you can use it to, to do basic administrative tasks, go in and clean out files, go in and do basic, basic administration on different servers and desktop systems and that kind of thing. Uh, you can also create desktop uh, uh, applications relatively easily. Uh, so if you want some kind of interface and you want to be able to click on buttons and type in information, and actually have that do something work like a desktop application uh, you can do that in python then the nice thing beyond that is that python works well with most of the api so most of the apis for things like storage and network services and again when i talk about cloud functions cloud functions are very 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 cool basically uh, this is compute on demand it's called serverless architecture so if i want something like machine vi vision on demand I can use Python to tap into that. Uh, again, storage services. Uh, if I want to do, if I want to create my own offsite backup routine or something like that, uh, I can use Python to connect to to whatever storage services I want to connect to, and then create the routine uh, for that. How that should happen. So Python is a great language. The only problem that you may run into is again, if you're going to be using public uh, hosting uh, services, again, GoDaddy, HostGator, that type of thing, uh, they they may not offer Python as an option as one of the scripting languages that's available. And there's a little bit more to it. Again, it's not, it doesn't have quite the legacy that PHP has. Um, so that's one of the things to think about. But Python, I would argue, if, if you're just a standard uh, IT administrator that's looking to improve your skill set, looking to improve what you can offer your company, your clients, I, I would argue probably Python is the best way to go.
Then we go to a language called JavaScript. So if you've ever done any kind of web app development or you've been looking into it, uh, JavaScript is a language that has probably come up. So whenever you take a look at a standard web page, uh, the standard web page, again, the bones of it is built, are built in HTML, uh, the formatting, again, the fonts and all that kind of stuff is done in CSS. But then any kind of interactive feature on the page, that's actually going to be done by JavaScript. So if you move your mouse over something and there's like a rollover effect, so the so the image changes to something else, that's done with JavaScript. If you have drop-down menus, so if you go to a website, if you go to elitecomputerguy.com and you go to a drop-down menu, right, and you hover or you click and, and a menu drops down, that's done in JavaScript. So when you're doing any kind of web apps and you need that interactive element, JavaScript is the language to go with. Go with. Uh, now, honestly, up until oh, I don't know, probably 11 years ago at this point. Uh, JavaScript, I, I hate to say it was an also ran, it was, it was a great programming language, but it was kind of one of those things that was lumped in with HTML and CSS and PHP. It was like, yeah, you need to know all of that and do to create a website. Uh, but it was kind of one of those, it's, it's an also, it's also you need to learn that. Well, one of the things that happened well, 11 years ago or whatever is that job uh, that uh, Steve Jobs decided to not use uh, Adobe Flash uh, on the new iPhones and the new iPads, right? So Adobe Flash was how we used to have animations and we also used to have interactivity on the web pages that we went to. Uh, there were a lot of problems with it. There are there security problems with it. There are resource problems with it. Adobe just kind of crapped the, <laughs> crapped the bed when it came to Flash. Flash was one of those things, like back in 2000, it, it had problems, but it gave you a lot of useful things, and so you could overlook the problems. By the time you got to 2009, 2010, it still had a lot of problems, and you know it seemed like the, move, the world was moving on, and so Steve Jobs just came in and said the obvious, said, you know, the world's moving on. The, these lower power, uh, these lower resource computers, iPhones, smartphones, and uh, tablet computers simply don't have the, the resources to deal with Adobe's crap. Uh, and so he said, we're just not gonna have Adobe Flash. And now back then, again, 10, 11 years ago, that was a big deal. Well, the problem came is that Adobe Flash had, had been solving solving a lot of problems for folks. Uh, if you wanted little games to play on a web page, you used Adobe Flash. Uh, if you wanted videos to play, you used Adobe Flash. Again, so much of that complicated interactivity was done with Adobe Flash. Well, when he killed Adobe Flash, uh, basically said, we're not gonna put it on iOS devices, uh, the world needed a better option. And so JavaScript actually ended up being a very good option for simply replacing Flash. Uh, lots of web developers already knew JavaScript. JavaScript was already used uh, for interactive design on web pages. And so it was kind of one of those things, well, oh, you know, if we add a couple of more things to JavaScript, we can get JavaScript to basically do, be doing all the stuff that Adobe Flash was doing, and it's already built into all these web browsers, and there's not all the, the, the massive security problems there are with Adobe Flash and everything else, so let's go with that. So really, about 10 or 11 years ago, there was a real big new push to, for JavaScript um, because it was now the default for any kind of interactivity uh, when you're dealing with, the, with web pages. And so JavaScript is very useful for you. So if, you're, if you wanna do things like, uh, again, if you're going to be doing any kind of web apps and you want that interactivity, if you want to be able to create basic little games in, in a web page, you can use JavaScript to do that. Basically, any kind of web development where you're going to need real-time interactivity on the web page, JavaScript is a way to go. Then the thing is, is once everybody is already using JavaScript, you know, people start thinking about it and they're like, well, you know, if we already know JavaScript, because that's one of the problems with programming language, right? There's different syntax, there's different delimiters, there's different ways you, you code. They are different languages. And so some people started thinking about it, and lots of different people started thinking about it. Like, well, if we already know, if we already know JavaScript, you know, to do some of these server functions in order to do some of these other functions that I need to do, I don't really want to have to completely learn a new programming language. 
Can we get JavaScript to do that since we already know this language, we already know the syntax? And that's where you start to get all the variations of JavaScript that are, that are out there. So if you need a server side, so when you're looking at JavaScript, JavaScript is something called a client side scripting language. What that means is the web browser on your computer is actually reading uh, the, the, the code that you wrote out in JavaScript and then is presenting you with something, a message box, that stupid little video game, whatever else. That's being run on the client side. So when I talked about a P, a PHP, PHP is a server side scripting language, so that is run on the server. But JavaScript is a client side uh, coding language, so it's run on the client. Well, some folks were thinking like, hey, you know, we already know Java. Could, could we just create a version of Java that would run on the server? So then if I'm trying to create a, a, a web application where I need, you know, both some kind of client side uh, service and some, of, some, some type of server side service, I can use the same programming language, language in order to write those two components. And that's where we get things like Node.js. So one of the cool parts, uh, if you get into the JavaScript world, is there are a lot of offshoots of JavaScript. There are a lot of different ways that JavaScript can be used in the modern world. So one once you learn JavaScript, you may be opening a lot more doors than you may first realize. And so that's one of the reasons that's a good language to learn. So next I want to talk about Java. Now to be clear, Java basically has nothing to do with JavaScript. This is one of the confusions. People think JavaScript is like Java Lite or something like that. No, JavaScript is JavaScript and Java is Java and these this type of word or naming choice is one of the things that makes the tech industry so annoying because people name things this way and you know, you know the average person is going to correlate the two. They're, they're gonna think JavaScript has something to do with Java when no. JavaScript is JavaScript and Java is Java. They're two different programming language, languages. So Java is a compiled programming language. So what that means is that you will put it through a piece of software called a compiler, uh, and then what will get spit out on the other side is your application that will be able to be read by the operating system of a computer, right? Uh, so back in the old days, compiled languages is the way everything went. Again, if you're dealing with C or C++ or anything else, Basically, you would type out all your, all your code, you would shove it through something called a compiler, and the compiler would spit out your program on the other side, and then whatever operating system you compiled uh, that program for would be able to, to run it. So if you compiled it for Windows, Windows would be able to run it. If you compiled it for Linux, Linux would be able to run it. If you compiled it for Unix, Unix would be able to run it. But you see, there's a bit of a problem there. We talk about the old uh, compiled languages. You would have to compile your program for each one of those operating systems. It was a process called porting. Uh, so if you've ever heard about that before where people talked about, oh, we have this application for Windows and we are going to port it to Mac or port it to Linux. Basically what they were talking about is they were going to recompile it for these different operating systems and most likely have to go in and do some modifications to the code to actually make it work. Uh, the problem is with that is that means uh, you have to write your program actually multiple number of times to get it to work on these different operating systems and that can be a problem especially like with lower level things if you're dealing with device drivers possibly your storage or things like that how your application talks to Windows may be very different than how it needs to talk to Linux. That's where Java came in. So basically Java came in long time ago, really popular around the 2000 time frame, because what was cool about Java is you can install what was called the Java runtime onto these different operating systems. So you can install Java onto Mac, and you can install Java onto Linux, and you can install Java onto Windows. And then when you created a program in Java, you simply had to program it to run for Java. So basically Java, that Java runtime acted as a layer so the people that administer Java, they would worry about the device drivers, they would worry about the storage, they would worry about all the lower level communications with the operating system, and then you could just program for Java, right? So people would install Java onto their different operating systems, and then you could simply code your program for Java, and then you could code it once, and then it would work on you know whatever uh, operating system had Java installed. Uh, so it was, it was great for a little while. It was great for a little while for a number of years and then people basically
basically, frankly, forgot about it. Again, this is an important thing to know about coding languages is they kind of come and then they go and then they come back sometimes. And so with Android, uh, Java is the, the main programming language for Android. And so I, I, I feel basically when Android came back, uh, when you started having the Android smartphones and the Android tablets, then there was a real push again for people to start learning Java, pushing pushing Java out. And so now many times Java is seen as like one of the number one programming languages uh, in demand in the world. I don't know. It was like a year or two ago. Um, it depends what these different programming languages, but it's one of the number one languages out there. The reason being is because you can use Java uh, in order to code for Android. So Java is a great language with the idea of basically being able to code for all of these different operating systems using one single programming language. It's a compilable uh, programming language. That means you, you, send, you, you take your code, you send it through the compiler. Uh, it's able to then run much faster uh, than the scripted programming languages and it's very useful. So you can use it for server administration tasks. You can use it uh, to create all kinds of desktop applications. You can use it to create Android applications uh, for smartphones and for uh, tablet devices. Uh, and it's a great overall programming language and is one of the ones that, that's most highest in demand. So especially if you're thinking about Android development, Java is probably the way to go. So we're talking about Android development, but then the question is, what about iOS development? So what if you like iPhones? What if you like iPads, that type of thing? If you want to code for iPhones or iPads, there's a coding language called Swift. And that's basically it. You can probably find some other way to code for, for iOS devices, but more or less the default is Swift. Swift is it. If you want to code for iOS devices, you're going to learn Swift. Uh, Swift... I don't know what else do you say about Swift. <laughs> if you want to code for iOS devices, learn Swift. That's about all I can say. Now, once we've talked about Android devices and we talked about iOS devices, then we go back to the normal Microsoft world, right? In this modern world of startup companies and Snapchat and Ubers and all that kind of thing. It's, it's easy to forget that, that Windows uh, desktop operating systems and server operating systems still run a huge portion of the world's computing, right? Uh, if, you, if, you, if you think about it, most desktop computers are, are Windows machines. Uh, servers in the enterprise environment, I'm not talking about web servers, servers in the, in the enterprise environment, Active Directory Exchange, all that kind of thing, uh, they're going to be Microsoft. And so one of the things you should be thinking about is if you're going to be in the enterprise Enterprise world thinking about what language works best for what is called the Microsoft stack and that would be C sharp uh, so Microsoft has been creating programming languages for a long time again back when I was newer in IT learning something called visual basic was the standard everybody basically learned uh, but now time has moved on and so basically C sharp is the language that you'll be wanting to learn if you want to be building more complicated applications in the Microsoft world especially Especially if you want to do things, if you want to be connecting uh, with Active Directory, if you want to be connecting Active Directory with Azure services and your local exchange uh, server and other th things, C Sharp will be the way to go. Uh, other programming languages may allow you to do that. Again, Python may allow you to do that, uh, but C Sharp is one of those. Again, it's like if you're in the Microsoft world, it's one of those weird things, right? Where if you want to do footloose and fancy free, you want to run Linux and all kinds of different operating systems and do all kinds of weird stuff, right? Learning Python or something else is a good way to go. But, you know, if, you, if you've if you decided on the Microsoft world, again, I'm not going to get into the argument one way or the other, but your company or you have, you've decided on Exchange Server, you've decided on Microsoft Active Directory, you've, ex you've decided on Azure Functions, right? If you're already, you're locked into the Microsoft world, it's one of those things you might as well use the Microsoft product that has been created uh, to, to, to most easily uh, solve your problems in the Microsoft world. It's one of those things I talk about, like uh, deciding between AWS and Azure. So Microsoft Azure, Microsoft's cloud platform, storage, and all kinds of stuff. And then, of course, you have AWS. They have their thing. Right. Well, if you're a startup company, uh, if, if you're a new company, then there are some questions about whether you should go with AWS or Azure. AWS has some benefits. Azure has some benefits. Which one you're going to go with? Again, we could sit down for three hours and hash it out and figure out which solution you could go with. But the thing to be thinking about, if you're in the Microsoft world, 
You've already bought all your cows. You already have your active directory service. You already have your experience. You already have all this stuff and your company isn't going to be migrating off of Microsoft, you know, within the next few decades, then my argument is go with Azure. Azure was built by Microsoft to work the best with their products. So why duct tape and super glue stuff together in order to make it work properly with AWS? You're already locked into Microsoft. So just, just admit, admit, admit that you're stuck with them and go with Azure. It's kind of the same way I would think about with C Sharp. Could, uh, could Java do some very good things in, in, in the Microsoft environment? Yes. Can Python do some very good things in the Microsoft environment? Yes. But you've already decided on Microsoft. You've already bought the cows. You've already bought all this crap. You know, just just go with C Sharp. Stop trying to be a cool kid all the time and go with the language that's actually built uh, to deal with your particular environment. So if you're in the Microsoft world, the Microsoft environment, I would highly, highly argue C Sharp's a good way to go. Then finally for this video, you get to the C, C++ world, right? So this is where you get a lot of folks, especially the computer science folks, real coders, real programmers, no C or C++. And it's like, yeah, you know, sort of. Again, depends on what you're trying to do. <laughs> Again, very important. It's not that any of these languages really are better or worse than any other language. It's what you're trying to solve for. So when you're dealing with a C, C++ world, you're generally dealing with things like uh, actually being able to modify uh, components of the operating system, doing things like writing device drivers. So I had a buddy of mine who was into C, C++, right? That, that was his job. And basically he was doing things dealing with autonomous vehicles in real time. So really, 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 really complicated, sophisticated problems where there's not a lot of user interface. Basically, he's coding for how the servo motors are going to move, how the sensor sensors are going to interact with each other, and trying to trying to get the communication to be best in a real time scenario. So for a lot of folks out there, they think C or C is the way to go, right? I want to be a real coder. I want to be a real pro I'm not I'm not gonna learn no py pythons for you know the script kiddies out there. I'm gonna learn C or C. The problem with C and C, um, especially for new people, is, is the problems that you're generally trying to solve with C, C, and are so complicated that generally a lot of new people they they don't know enough to solve the problems that C and C solve. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like you actually have to understand a lot about computers um, to get to the point where C and C++ are useful tools for you to be able to try to solve the problems. Um, imagine if you wanted to be a handyman. Imagine if you had the idea, I'm going to go out and I'm going to create a business and I'm going to be a handyman. Um, and then somebody gave you a crane. <laughs> you didn't have a hammer. <laughs> You didn't have some radial sander. You didn't have a paintbrush. You had a crane. To be clear, to be clear, a crane is a very powerful piece of construction equipment. A crane is very useful. A crane can be very, very valuable. In the future, you may need a crane. But if you have not printed out your business cards yet and somebody plops down a crane, you're not really going to know what to do with it, right? So I think C and C++ is very good, again, for the computer science folks, the people that really want to get deep into computers. Again, if you're going to be going to a four-year uh, program, again, get your bachelor's degree in computer science, then it makes sense that you're going to use, you're going to learn C and C++ because in the first or second year, depending on how they do it, you're going to learn C, you're going to learn C++, and then you're going to do that. Then, then the next class, you're gonna learn how to do something with that. And then the next class, you're gonna do more things with that. And the next class is going to keep getting more and more complicated. And your teachers are going to guide you down the path on, okay, now that you know these languages, this is how you do something useful with them. The problem with new people, again, especially if you're, you're, you're self-studying, you're, you're, you're trying to learn this yourself, you learn it, and then it's like, Okay, it's kind of like me with languages. Um, in my life, I've actually, 
I've spent a lot of time in classes learning languages, German, and French, and Spanish, right? Too much time. I spent years, I've got a weird life. Anyways, I've spent years of my life learning languages. I am horrible at every other language than English. The reason is, is I'm in the United States. The United States is 3,000 miles by 2,000 miles. We're bordered by Canada at the top, right? The fact of the matter is, when you go traveling around the world, when I go to Europe, I can speak English. When I go to India, I can speak English. When I go to Thailand, I can speak English. When I go to Costa Rica, I can speak English. When I go to Chile, I can mostly speak English. So the reality is, I have spent years and years and years and years being given a good education, learning all of these cool languages. And I can barely speak any of them because I, as an American, I genuinely do not have a use for them. We all just speak English. I'm in Baltimore, I can travel all the way to San Francisco, and I will never need to know anything other than English, right? Um, and that's one of the problems you run into with some of these, these languages. Again, like C or C++. You can sit there, you can, you can self-study, you can learn, but if you're not really sure what the hell to do with it, to do next, then, then, then you're gonna lose it. Again, like when I tell you to learn PHP, you can spend a week learning PHP, and by the end of the week, you can actually be creating applications uh, that have real-world uses. You can be creating notification applications. You can be creating system applications. You can be creating the back end for websites and that type of thing. In one week, you can be building something. Again, Python. Within a couple of days, you can be doing something useful. And if, you, if you're able to do something useful, then, then you learn from doing that. Then you learn what you don't really understand. So then you're able to focus on that to learn more. And then when you learn that, then you figure out this other thing and then you keep building, right? So, so maybe again, if you learn Python, you might, be, you might say, oh, I'm gonna learn Python in order to, I don't know, create some little desktop application so I can keep track of whatever IP addresses are currently connected to the network. And then once you do that, you go, oh, look, there's these IP addresses that are connected to the network. You know, it'd be nice if I could click on the IP address and actually be able to pull up information about that client computer. And so then you figure out how that works. And then you're like, oh, and you know, since I'm the administrator anyway, if I could click on that, get information, and then if I know there's a problem with that system, if I could then remotely get into that system or remotely perform tasks, that would be useful. And so you go and you do research, right? And so that's a way you can go where you start. And yes, you start with the variables and the loops and all the boring crap you're always gonna have to learn. But then again, with PHP, with Python, with, with JavaScript, uh, with Swift, with, with C Sharp, you know, it, it may be a week of boring stuff that you've got to get through, but then once you get done with that boring stuff, then you can be like, oh, I bet I could create this little app to do this. And then it does that. Like, oh, okay, now that I've done that, uh, I'd also like it to do X, Y, and Z. And then you figure it out, right? And that's part of the motivation. That's part of the learning process with these programming languages. And that's one of the problems with things like C and C++ is it's not that they're bad languages. Again, if you're gonna be a computer science person, if you really, really wanna get into the nitty gritty, like really co coding, again, for device drivers, for, for, for operating system, kernels, that type of thing, C and C++ uh, can be very very useful. The problem is, is that for most folks that are trying to get in the technology world, especially self-study, boot camp, IT professionals, that type of deal, literally C and C++ are solving problems that you may not even know that those kind of problems exist. And so you kind of, it's probably going to be a bit of an issue for you and it's going to be hard for keeping motivation and you know continuing to be excited to learn about, about the language. And so there you go. Now you know the number one coding language to learn. That's right. HTML. <laughs> HTML. Hypertext markup language. That is the language to learn. And then CSS and then go learn a language that's actually gonna pay the rent. To be clear for any noobs out there, HTML is not gonna pay the rent. But you need to know HTML. Again, if you're a new person, you're watching this, learn HTML, like you gotta know HTML.
if you don't know HTML, life is going to be very difficult for you. Don't worry. It'll just take it'll just take a day. No big deal. But then again, like I say, with these other languages, it really depends on what your situation is, what you're trying to solve for, what people in your area, you know, they're 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 hiring for, so on and so forth. Now, I didn't talk about some of the other languages out there. I didn't talk about Perl. <laughs> talk about blast from the past. I saw that. I can't, I can't, it's, it's on my screen right now. And I'm like, what? Really? There's 14,000 Perl jobs? I'll be darned. <laughs> I'll be darned, as they say. I didn't talk about Perl. I didn't talk about R. I didn't talk about Dart. I didn't talk about Go. I didn't talk about fill in the blanks. There are, again, as I've said before, there are a lot of other languages out there that, again, they are in use, they are in production, and they are in demand. The problem you get to, especially if you're the type of person watching a class like this, is again, where do you stop? Where do you focus the whole nine yards? If companies in your area are hiring Go developers, you may want to learn Go. If they're hiring R developers, you may want to uh, learn R. Uh, again, Dart developers, so on and so forth. I would say out of, out of what I've talked about today, these are the best programming languages to start looking at. Again, depending on what your situation is, PHP is a great language. Python is a great language. JavaScript is a great language. Java is a great language. Language. Swift is a great language, and C Sharp is a great language. I would argue these are, what is that, one, two, three, four, five, six. Probably these are the six of the languages you would sit there, and again, depending on your situation and what people are hiring for, I would pick out of those. Again, as I've said in other videos, you are not married to your coding language. If you start with PHP, it doesn't mean you have to die with PHP. You can learn PHP, figure things out, solve your particular problems, and then realize nobody else in your area has your particular problems, and then you can learn, go learn C Sharp, right? You're not married to these languages. So what I would say is go pick the language uh, that works best for you. You're most likely to get hired with in your area. Get as much experience as possible as you can with that language. And then when you kind of get to the end of your learning track, you basically more or less get as far as you can go. That's when you can look at some of these other languages. Again, Dart and Go and R and Perl. Perl. I'm still laughing about Perl. Perl. Who knew? <laughs> Perl. Uh. And you can see maybe one of those languages uh, does something um, that that solves other problems, right? You know, as, as you're learning to build applications, as you're learning to build software, as you're learning to programmatically administer systems, you may you may sit there and you may run into issues with the language that you pick. You know, your language. Java or C, C Sharp or whatever does X, Y, and Z very good, uh, but there's no option for these other things. And so that's where once, once you kind of get to the end of what you're learning, you start to feel very comfortable, confident. That's when you can start saying, okay, these are the other problems that I have. What languages will solve those problems? And then, then you may find out, go dark. Pearl <laughs> X, Y, or Z and go on from there. So that's just a basic video for you today on the best programming language is, of course, HTML. Not a programming language, the markup language. Trick question, trick question. Oh, it's horrible. Oh, you get these first years, you get these first year coders, you know, they're freshmen in college. Oh, they come to my video. I don't know why. My vid the video that I put up is something like a decade old, 10 years old, called Introduction to HTML Programming. And these kids just love to come and just beat up on it. To be clear, HTML is not a programming language. It's a markup language. But, you know, it all just kind of gets mushed together. So these are some things to think about. Um, with that, as always, I enjoy doing this video and look forward to seeing you in the next one. Apparently, the type of content you just saw is not what Susan W. wants for the future of YouTube. This means that recommendations by YouTube to this channel have dropped massively and views are becoming comically small. I hate to ask. I used to say I would never ask. But if you could subscribe, like, comment, and most importantly, share the videos that you appreciate, that may help slow the death of this channel. Do remember that if anything at all happens to this channel, you can go to elithecomputerguy.com to view the content and access information not available on YouTube.